I'm Elizabeth Sherrill, and I'm here to talk to you about the use of scenario earthquakes for seismic hazard assessment in the central United States. The work presented here was initially connected to the Indiana State Multi-Hazard Mitigation Plan, where we tried to answer the question, how does a state like Indiana prepare for future relatively unknown earthquake hazards? So low probability interplate earthquakes are really important to consider when looking at seismic hazard assessment for states in the Midwest. Um, these images show damage from a magnitude 5.2 earthquake that occurred in Mount Carmel, Illinois in 2008. And the figure on the right shows the Did You Feel It reports for that event. It was felt across 16 states in the Midwest. And it was a gentle reminder of the potential impact that a larger event occurring closer to a populated area in this region could have. The most well-known seismic zones in the Midwest are shown in the figure on the left. The New Madrid seismic zone is located down near Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Kentucky, and the Wabash Valley seismic zone is a little further north between Illinois and Indiana. The figure on the right also shows historical earthquake locations um, in the southern parts of Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana and extending up into the central parts of those states. Um, those are the teal dots in that figure. And then the pink stars represent the location of prehistoric earthquakes that are uh, their estimated locations and magnitudes based on sand blow deposits. When assessing seismic hazards, there's two methods. Um, the first is probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. On the left, you'll see a figure of the USGS probabilistic seismic hazard map. Um, and so this is based mostly on um, uh, the number of earthquake sources near a given location and the activity of those sources. So for Indiana, it's largely controlled by the New Madrid and Wabash Valley seismic zones. And you'll see that it's highest in the southwest portion of the state and decreases as you go north and east. The other method is deterministic seismic hazard assessment. And the figure on the right um, shows an example of a deterministic scenario for the worst case New Madrid event. Deterministic scenarios are arbitrary scenarios representing individual cases that might influence the impact of potential future earthquakes. They allow us to evaluate the types of damage associated with realistic possible future events. And one thing to note is that um, most hazard work in the central U eastern United States has focused on New Madrid and places like Indiana have not really considered other sources. So for this study, uh, we decided to look at five deterministic scenarios. Um, the locations we selected were um, uh, a magnitude 7.6 in New Madrid and a magnitude 7.3 in Wabash Valley, which you can see on the left. Um, we also selected some moderate earthquakes near population centers in Indiana. So we selected a magnitude 6.2 in Darmstadt, Indiana, which is just north of Evansville, um, and then a magnitude 5.8 um, southeast of Indianapolis. Um, and then we also selected a magnitude 6.2 in Anna, Ohio. There's a small seismic zone just to the east of the Indiana-Ohio border known as the Anna Seismic Zone. And so the Wabash Valley and New Madrid events um, we selected based on historical seismicity and so the faults in those areas are a little bit better constrained. For Darmstadt and Indianapolis, um, we tried to base them off of where there are uh, faults mapped in Indiana, uh, but these fault locations are a little more poorly constrained. So I'll come back to how we might address that later, but um, generally we tried to place them in somewhat realistic um, earthquake source locations. So for this analysis, we used um, two different softwares. The first was the USGS um, ShakeMap program. Um, ShakeMap uses geographically specific ground motion models, the location of the event and the magnitude of the event to create maps of ground motion and shaking intensity for real and scenario earthquakes. And so you can see uh, an intensity map for the Indianapolis scenario on the left. And so we're able to take this ground uh, motion information and place it, put it into FEMA's Hazus multi-hazard software program. And so the FEMA MH program is a complex tool that can both estimate the hazard and the impact on humans and infrastructure. And that includes human casualties, economic damage, infrastructure impacts, and some secondary effects. So the first part of the analysis was doing a total economic loss comparison for the five scenarios that I mentioned before. And so in this table, the columns represent those scenarios. And then the rows represent the area where we calculated economic loss. So the first row is the area where greater than or equal to 10% G peak ground acceleration was experienced. And that's thought to be the greatest extent of um, the scenario. Uh, the second row is the state of Indiana. So we calculated losses for each scenario for just the state of Indiana. 
And then the third, fourth, and fifth rows are for major cities within Indiana, uh, Evansville, Indianapolis, and Fort Wayne. So a few things to note are that the Anna Ohio event does not seem to have major impacts within the state. It may be important for Ohio to consider that in seismic uh, hazard assessment, but it's less relevant for Indiana. Um, a large Wabash Valley event and these moderate events near population centers are far worse for the state of Indiana than a New Madrid event, and um, they must be considered when looking at seismic hazard assessment. For the city of Evansville, um, it was somewhat surprising that that moderate Darmstadt earthquake um, just north of the city um, was much more impactful than a um, larger Wabash Valley event um, just to the west of the state border and pretty close to Evansville as well. So both hazards that need to be considered for Evansville, Indiana. And then although unlikely, even a moderate sized earthquake near India Indianapolis could produce major impacts far greater than effects of larger, more distant earthquakes like a New Madrid or Wabash Valley event. And to put that into perspective, um, the losses for the state of Indiana for an Indianapolis scenario are, are estimated around $7.21 billion. And for a Wabash Valley um, scenario for the state of Indiana, it's about $8.17 billion. So the losses for the state of Indiana are almost equivalent for Indianapolis or Wabash Valley um, earthquakes. So definitely important to take these moderate population center um, earthquakes into account when assessing seismic hazard. The next portion of the analysis is a sensitivity analysis. So as I mentioned before, the Darmstadt and Indianapolis earthquakes were placed near known faults, um, but the actual um, orientation and location of those faults is, is um, more uncertain. And so we wanted to see if we're wrong about the magnitude, depth, strike, or dip of these scenario events, how does that impact losses? And so these figures in the bottom just give you an idea of how we specified the fault plane within ShakeMap. We're able to specify the four corners of the fault and then change the orientation um, or move it up and down to change the depth or change its size for magnitude. So the first parameter was magnitude, and as was expected, um, magnitude has a major control on damage, and there's an exponential increase in losses with increased magnitude. Um, the figure on the left is showing total economic losses. The figure on the right is showing number of buildings damaged. The symbols in the figure on the right indicate different levels of damage, so slight, moderate, extensive, or complete. And the colors uh, represent the different cities. Yellow is Indianapolis, and teal is Darmstadt. So um, one thing to note is that about a magnitude 5.4 or 5.5 uh, results in multi-billion dollar losses for Indianapolis and Darmstadt respectively. Another comparison that I wanted to make was looking at the same magnitude event but for each of the cities. So this is showing um, that Indianapolis would be expected to experience about $7.15 billion in losses for a magnitude 5.8 and about 23,000 buildings damaged. For Darmstadt, the same magnitude event would result in about $3 billion in losses and 7,000 buildings damaged. Um, so for the same magnitude event, just closer to a larger population center, um, it results in over double the losses for Indianapolis versus Darmstadt. The next parameter that we looked at was depth. Um, and so it's an inverse relationship to what magnitude was as depth increases, um, economic losses and buildings damage decrease. Um, one thing to point out is that um, Depths shallower than about 20 kilometers result in multi-billion dollar losses, and so these shallow events are far more hazardous than mid-crustal events. Next were the um, changes in orientation. Um, so this is showing our five trials for orientation changes for the Darmstadt event uh, near Evansville, Indiana. The left is showing the default values uh, for dip and strike, and then um, the other columns are just showing changes in dip angle or dip direction, and changes in strike. And so for Darmstadt, we found that the, um, the varying strike trial um, had resulted in 13% greater losses, and that was largely because the strike was parallel to the city center. Um, for Indianapolis, we did the same thing. We changed dip direction, dip angle, and strike, and we found that um, the shallow dipping trial um, point directed towards the city resulted in 32% greater losses than our default trial. So it's important, um, these help to provide constraints on if we're wrong about um, the orientation or magnitude or depth of the fault, uh, they can add max and mins to um, uncertainty for our values on losses. Additionally, for the sensitivity analysis, I'd like to look at secondary effects, so I have not run the loss calculations for these, 
Um, these maps are showing outputs from the USGS ground failure tool of percent aerial occurrence of liquefaction and landsliding. Um, and these are for the Darmstadt scenario, which is near Evansville, and Evansville is located on the Ohio River, and it's also near some lake sediments, and there's um, steeper topography in southern Indiana. So both of these secondary effects are important and could contribute to losses. So um, I would like to add these into HAZIS um, to calculate losses. So then some future work and applications. Um, these are just examples of the magnitude 5 and magnitude 6 trials for Indianapolis. Um, showing building economic losses by census tract. And so um, I could see where we could run these suites of scenarios and try to get a more complete picture of the range of losses for the city um, to try to better focus mitigation efforts um, to different census tracts. Um, additionally, in Hazus, uh, you can plot essential facilities and look at the damage expected based on an earthquake scenario. Um, so similar thing, if you ran a suite of scenarios, then you'd get a better uh, view of what the risk um, to the city and its essential facilities might be for a low probability interplate earthquake. Um, so these maps are just showing uh, it's the red dots or red triangles show greater than 75% probability of at least moderate damage due to a 6.0 earthquake in Indianapolis. So in conclusion, Moderate earthquakes near major Midwest cities can have losses greater than or equal to the losses from a New Madrid or Wabash Valley earthquake, and it's important to take them into consideration when assessing seismic hazard in states like Indiana. Um, magnitude and depth have first order influence on losses, but orientation differences can increase losses, um, for, and for the scenarios we ran, it was by about 13 to 32 percent. And then a suite of scenarios can potentially provide risk insights for low probability events. And lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, a bunch of people who have assisted me with answering questions about ShakeMap or Hazus or running the USGS ground failure tool so I can produce liquefaction and landsliding maps. Um, thank you.